Thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, uh, from all of us at the Yard, we just want to say thank you also to Nancy and to the Woods Hole Library. Um, uh, Rafael Xavier is an artist that the Yard had in residence two years ago. Um, he's a veteran breakdancing artist um, who worked with uh, the very well-known um, hip-hop dance company, Renny Harris Pure Movement, um, and has uh, gone on to create his own work, um, which we will be presenting this weekend. So, uh, Coel was passing out things, and I'll just do a quick plug about what we have going on this weekend. Um, Raphael and his company, who are here, which maybe we'll have them introduce themselves in a minute, um, are performing on Thursday night in Chilmark, across the pond um, <laughs> at 8 p.m. at the yard, and then again on Saturday at 6.30 p.m. And then we also have a family-friendly performance that's happening. Um, Sokyo Rose and his uh, company Case Closed is gonna be at the yard Friday night at 6.30. Um, that's another urban dance performance, which is followed by a family dance party, which should be a great time for everyone to, to all move together. Um, and I do want to also mention that next week on Tuesday, um, Ragamala Dance Company is going to be here um, for, for another lecture at 7.30 p.m. And we would love to have you back for that to, to sort of hear about this um, uh, Indian company. They do Bharatanatyam. Um, and sort of an amazing family dynamic. Uh, so that will be another wonderful opportunity to, to hear about another another style of dance. So without further ado, <laughs> I have to use the podium. They gave it to me, so I have to use it. I feel like somebody. Yeah. Today we have begun. No. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. This is uh, it's pretty great to be back here a second time um, after working on the work two years ago and now we get to show the completed work. Um, I like to talk a lot and sometimes I'll get like tripped up because I'll just go on tangents. If I do that, just throw something at me and be like, dude, get back on track. You're losing me. Um, I am proud to say that I am a 47-year-old breaker who still rolls around <laughs> at a time when people were talking about um, you know in my 20s it was excuse me it was uh, you're not gonna be able to do that too much longer <laughs> then in my 30s it was you don't have too long before you're <laughs> not gonna be able to do this what are you gonna do when you can't do it anymore then in my 40s, it was, you still doing this? <laughs> Aren't you hurt? Does your body hurt? Like, what are you going to do when you can't? They don't realize that this has become my livelihood. Um, so, as a hip-hop uh, dancer or someone that grew up um, at the, the beginning stages of what we know of as hip-hop today, um, it came from the street by way of television. So I got a chance to see New York City Breakers on Soul Train in 1982-83 and I was in the seventh grade. I was going to the seventh grade and that year I went to school the kids were, were already doing it because they were from the city and they had cousins and relatives that were going back and forth to New York City and bringing the information back. So living on the outside of, of the city I didn't get that information as fast as they did. But in a matter of two years, it had come and gone. The school, the, the, the place that was almost like a, a safe haven for something that was a gift to kids who had nothing to do when the programs were, were the funding from the programs um, was taken away, the school embraced this dance. The year, a year after that, someone in California got hurt in a mall and the mall, uh, the parents sued the mall. So around the world it became a liability if you were caught doing it and you got hurt. So the schools and different places in the city got scared. So if you were caught doing it, you got expelled. Because it was going to cause the school some problems. So we began to hide. A couple of us hid, we would cut class, that's not cool I know, but we would cut class and practice in the gym. Um, the gym showers are in rooms where 
Uh, we knew where the faculty would go in and out of at certain times. It was just something about the dance that, that just kept me in a, in a, it was almost like fantastical because I couldn't believe I saw it and then I just, I just took to it like, like, I can't even explain anything else that did this, that made me feel this way. Um, long story short, I kept playing with it. Um, I was being ridiculed by still <laughs> playing and you still break dancing, get a job that's not going to do anything for you. But I didn't think of that. I just, I just I had fun, like going to a court with a basketball and you're playing basketball. Nobody's going to be a pro. You just do it because it's exercise. Long story short, I ran into a, uh, some guys at a club and they were, they were club dancers, but there was one breaker and when I saw him it was like gold like oh my god this guy this was like uh, this was in the 90s so it was 10 years later I, I saw someone else do it um, so I got excited and I tried to find them after the club and they were gone and then a couple years after that um, I ran into them again and one of the guys came up to me and said this guy named Rennie Harris is doing a hip-hop version of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> it's going to be the hip-hop dancers against the breakers, like Capulets against the Montague. Right? <laughs> and I was, a, I was a breaking purist. There was nothing better than breaking. And I said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm not interested. Two years later, I ended up going to the audition anyway. And Rennie looked at me and was like, I heard a lot about you. Get in where you fit in. And so I did, I went there and um, I ended up being a dancer in this hip-hop version of Romeo and Juliet. And it went on the road for about 10 years. I got out of it in, uh, this was 97 and I left in 2002 to begin my own work. So I, set, I say that to set it up. But when I started really dancing again, we went on the road with a show called Cool He Urban Beat. There was a group of tap dancers, um, hip-hop dancers, a, a major percussionist. Um, and a DJ. And this show toured for about three years and it began to put me in this place of really feeling like there may be an opportunity for me to turn something that I did as a kid into a livelihood. But again, it was still play. So this is, uh, this is a clip of some of the things that I was doing on the road and how the dance look was when I was in my late 20s and early 30s. The most important thing, anything that you do, is to keep doing it. Longevity, consistency, and practice. But you move into the spaces that you're supposed to move into, and not based on what someone else tells you. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the next one. Um, so that was that was a transition from um, being on the road and performing and like spinning on it all the time, and everything was just powerful. It was just you just went like a wind up doll, and people were excited about the spins, which were the 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 thing that you associate with breaking or hip hop dance was always the the. Um, what do you call that? The, uh, the dynamic moves. But I quickly realized that you can't do that too long. <laughs> and everybody, everybody who said that to me, I started to realize, oh, that's what they meant. <laughs> You're not going to be able to do that too much longer. Um, so I, I kind of like start to feel like maybe I should change the way I approach the dance. And I was really stubborn about it. And then uh, something happened. You can play the, play the next one. Um, some of you may be familiar with Anna Halperin, um, an older dancer who she, she considers herself the breaker of modern dance. That struck a chord with me, right? Very interesting. Well, she was creating diagrams of how you move and things like that. And I had this stuff in my head, but I didn't know how, um, I didn't know how to get it out. And all I wanted to do was take the, the movement and move forward. 
this was, is a representation of what people think zero is. Zero is the most important number in the scale because without zero, there's no, the numbers don't make sense. It doesn't, there's no growth with the numbers. But space is also something that stands out to me. The circle is a representation of um, uh, protection and, and uh, in, infinity and all of these things that, that really make sense about the dance and what we're so attracted to and why it's so important um, to, the, to the dance. That's me being silly. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is how I felt in my 20s and 30s, very cocky, to be honest with you. <laughs> because a lot of guys were just getting into it, they were 10, 15 years younger than me, so I felt like, you know, kind of arrogant at, at one time, like, you know, I can't be stopped, and I'm the greatest, and all, you know, all of the things that go, that comes along with this great <laughs> So this is, again, me playing around, this is how the dance is, it's just street, people uh, are watching. This is where it came from. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, not associated with the dance at all, I was put, let's just say I was knocked on my butt, right? I got a spine injury that between C5 and C6 that took my whole left side away. I always get touchy when I, when I, I get like, a, and I was paralyzed for a little while. Um, but again, being stubborn, I tried to move and kept moving until I was like, no, something's, <laughs> something's wrong here. Like, I'm not supposed to be moving at all. So I was on a drip bag twice a day uh, uh, for three months, lorazepam, oxycontin, oxycodone, medral dose, vancomycin, Bactrim, all of these, and I don't drink or smoke, so my body was very sensitive. Um, and I started to feel weak. And this was the most embarrassing time. Doing an intravenous medicine thing. Pause that for a minute. <laughs> so I have this pick line hanging out of my arm. I'm still a little cocky, but I'm like, yo, dude, you can't be cocky and you're sick. You got a problem. So I was in the, in the Kennedy Center about to do a performance. Still not supposed to be performing, but I'm cocky. Still, see that little, that little cockiness still lingers around in all of us. And, and the, the, the tech time threw me off, right? I have to plug into this drip bag twice a day at a certain time, right? There was nowhere I could go because the thing has to be high and has to be level so it drips if anybody ever had that thing. The only place I could go was in the stall of a bathroom. I'm sitting on the floor, as you can see, drip bag hanging from the ceiling, totally embarrassed. A dude comes in, first he sees me standing on the, the toilet, <laughs> and he's like, what is this guy doing? So I'm hanging the thing in the, in the tiles in the ceiling, and he walks out the door like this. He walks out like this. <laughs> <laughs> and brings the cops back. So I'm sitting on the floor, I see the cops come in, and he's like, hey, um, are you okay in there? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, what's the problem? So I explained to him, and he really gets concerned, like, oh my God, are you sure you're okay? You need anything? I'm like, no, I'm fine. But that was the most embarrassing time. Although it was, it was much net needed, it was very necessary, it was just embarrassing because here I am thinking I'm unstoppable, I'm, I can't be stopped, and I'm the greatest, and all these arrogant things, and this happened. So I'm not invincible, I'm not, <clears throat> it's possible, you can be, you can be hurt. Um, keep going for a second. So because of that, I started to approach the dance very differently. I thought, if I do it the way I'm used to doing it, I'm going to bang something up and really mess myself up and I can't do that. So I started to approach the floor now more importantly than I was before. Everything already took place on the floor, but I thought if I was already down there, there's no way I can get hurt. So I developed a series of exercises that turned into dance. Um, and it was really thinking about where the body is, 
um, taking the, the, the vertical space away and reconfiguring what I'm thinking about moving in this, this space. So um, it just became navigating your, my way through this space on the floor. Uh, I taught at UCLA just to get myself back into uh, the swing of things and people caught on to it, like the university started to catch on to it. So they would ask me to teach this at their universities and it went from UCLA to UCI, UC Riverside, Point Park, all these different places. But I, I also started to become aware of my body and how, was, how it, this stuff can fine tune me and make me stronger. And so heal at the same time I was able to move. Um, was, that, was that the end? All right, cool. Um, so I, I could heal at the same time I was able to move. So ultimately, the, this dance has taught me a whole lot about the body and about life um, and how there's a story where, and everybody goes through this, when you realize you're not going to be able to do something for a long period of time, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? You figure it out. It's inevitable. We great tennis players or basketball players, but there's fear of not being able to do something that you you love. So with the dance, what I'm doing now is kind of taking apart um, the taking apart the big movements, cutting cutting them in half, cutting them in half cutting them in half until I get a vocabulary that I can teach to anyone and anybody and create a vocabulary that is universal. So it's not about, when you think about breaking, the definition of breaking in the hip hop world is two dancers dancing, uh, I mean sorry, two records being played back to back, the break of the record and dancers breaking on that instrumental section of the record. That's the break part, you dance on that, you break dancing. Makes total sense to me. People don't do that anymore, right? Well, they do, but this generation doesn't, they, they're not aware of that thing. It doesn't make sense. So I can't put my thing on students of any age. We don't operate that way. So now breaking has become to take apart, decipher, decode, find a solution, put back together again, find something that works for the individual, right? That's what breaking is. That's what breaking is by definition, and that's how I teach, and that's how I create... Uh, Dance, uh, dance performances where now I can sustain the dance without breaking myself up. <laughs> Go to um, point of interest, the section that's um, the last section where we begin uh, the freeze part. Okay, that's good. Is that up on the thing?
Okay, go to the, the beginning of the quiet section. <clears throat> That's fun. That's good. So, are you breathing for us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I show this, uh, I can show anything in here, but I, I chose this section because one of the things that you're ridiculed about in a the, in the cipher, in a circle, the, the hip hop circle, is repetition. Repetition I find very important. Um, there's growth there, there's habit, it creates momentum, that's something else. But as a performer in a performance setting, um, you begin to kind of break rules and <coughs> there's something that the audience is expecting and when you take the rules that have existed uh, I don't want to say rules the tools that have existed in other forms and you apply them to something that's brand new people go ah right I didn't think that's that was possible I didn't think that's okay in the, the hip-hop world. Also, dancing to no music. I didn't have the volume down. There's just no music playing in that section. That's the other thing. You, you, you associate hip-hop dance with this beat all the time and just too loud or just bumping, and right? What are you thinking when you hear when there's no music, right? Um, where's the music coming from? What is, where's the rhythm? What are you feeling? How, do you, how does the audience... Uh, navigate their way around something that they didn't expect. This is what I'm thinking now creating creating the work. Um, and go to the, the next section. Um, move forward a little bit. Or we just do the arms and legs. Keep going. That's fine. And there's still no music. That is called humility. <laughs> um, it was one of those things where you can't be you can't be tough all the time. Like people see you do that, and you're like, you know, you feel like a superstar. They pat you on the back. Wow, that's amazing. And there was never for a long time there was never a moment in my life where I wanted people to see me kind of fail or not be able to do something. And as simple as that is, I can't get up. Like, you can see the whole show, and after the show, you guys are clapping. Like, oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. I can't get up from the back row. <laughs> like, literally, I cannot, right? So in the beginning, something happens, and instead of, like, just making one person look like they can't do something, I figured, well, I can't do that. As simple as that is, I can't do that. Just help me up. <laughs> it's, a, it's a play on <laughs> that thing. It's a play on that thing 
not on your mind, but no, it's a play on the, the idea of, um, of um, vulnerability. Can I say that? Can mm -hmm. I say? So s some of the things in here, you hear us breathing hard, you, we're soaking wet, um, you're looking at me like, can he keep up with those young kids? Like, he looks like he's going to have a heart attack. Like, all these things are going on in the audience's head, and mine too. But moments like that, just, you know, I just want people to, to know that, yes, I, I can do this stuff, but I'm human, I can fall apart, I can not make something, I can fail, I can try, I can push, and I need help from young dude. Um, so all these things are, is, is, they're part of how I make work now. So the work is, is definitely sustainable. This is an hour performance. It took us about three years, <coughs> over three years to, to, to build this. Um, and uh, it's a multi-generational work. I think it's important to share this stage with, with younger generations. Uh, 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 uh. Josh, you're 27? Yes. 32? 40? And 47. So you can see there's <coughs> generations on the on the stage. Um, and I think that's important, especially with hip-hop forms, because there's not many elders who can perform, other than rap, or DJ, or every, every, every element except, <laughs> every element except breaking, you won't see uh, this kind of generation gap on stage. It's not, it's not. Uh, maybe in Europe, right? Some of those guys are very, very powerful still in their older age. Um, but in the States, it's very rare that you can see uh, an elder, an o older person share the stage with young guys and really still be interesting. Um, so again, ultimately, my idea of creating work with a form from the street that's, that's really uh, hasn't been pushed uh, or created in this way is what I'm interested in. How long will I be able to do this and sustain um, this, this physical form? And there's always people like Anna Halperin uh, uh, Lucinda Childs, Ralph Lemon, mm. all these people are still active. So it doesn't mean that I can't, I, I, if I don't do this, that doesn't mean that I can't perform or be able to move. I just have to modify my approach and apply the different things that I've learned over the years. Uh, mature performers or other performers um, who have some tools that I can, I can use. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> No questions. <laughs> Good, sir. Yeah, talk. Up, can you talk a little bit about the beginnings of breakdancing, and was there a competitive aspect to it? At, uh, is there a competitive aspect to it on the street, or was there? Yeah, it it continues today. It just moved from the it's still on the street, but it continues on major uh, competition scale. Red Bull has a major competition, uh, super worldwide. Um, there's a there's an international battle competition called um, uh, Battle of the Year, which was one of the first ones to in the, that started in Germany um, in 94, 93? Technically 90, right. but it wasn't called Battle of the Year until 91. Okay, so it's been going on in Europe for a long time, and it, it began as that on the street, different crews, um, war colors, or you know, whatever you wanted to call it from different neighborhoods, whether rival or not. Um, it was always about my crew is better than yours. My neighborhood is better than yours. Um, let's just let's just go at it. But I was talking to, to to Ricky Stunts not too long ago, and I thought about it. And at that time, there were only probably about ten moves, right? So you you kind of mix and match those moves, put them in a combination. Um, no one was really like cutting anything in half. It, it, it was brand new. It was a kid's dance. It was brand new. And it was influenced by other forms that just became uh, its own thing eventually. Um, but yes, it was a competitive thing then. It's still competitive now. And some of those guys that were, that were never talked about um, at that time are still hitting on the street today. Uh, John, um, Zone... Wayne, uh, Bliss. Wayne Bliss, they're still on the street, and they're 52, 53, yeah, 54, 55, 56, <laughs> their grandkids are on the street with them too, some of them. Um, so it, for, for them it's really real, it's real. Um, so yes, there's a competition then, there's a competition now. I saw one over here. 
Could we meet your company members and hear a little bit about their backgrounds? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> when you come along, would you talk about what was involved in your recovery after your injury in addition to the, um, <coughs> the drip part of it? What was the physical, um, what did you have to do physically to recover? That seemed very severe. Yeah, and, and I think it was my ignorance. Like, I'll, I'll recover. It's just a simple injury. I'll recover. That made it last as long, right? Um, they say between C5 and C6, there was a... They, they first thought my spine was like this, right? So everybody panicked. And I had insurance at the time, so it was really good insurance. And everybody was running around trying to help me. And I had friends who had... Uh, good doctors and they were turning me on to some um, back doc chiropractors and stuff like that and so I go to the doctor <laughs> it was funny I go to the doctor and I'm scared because I'm like I can't move my left side is broke up I can't I can't do nothing because my spine snapped they got me scared right so I saw the x-ray and this this is what my spine looked like normal and I was like that's my spine? <laughs> they were like, yeah. I said, oh, I'm good. <laughs> That's what I, what I need to do. What I need, I was fine, but they had me scared. So, but there was, a, there was a space between C5 and C6 that looked like a cotton ball. Like, if you guys ever saw your, your spine, your, your vertebrae, um, there's like little disc spaces in there, and you can see them. But right in that spot, it was like a cotton ball, like literally puffy like that. And my, there was a bruise on the back of my neck. I lost range of motion here and here. I couldn't touch my chin to my chest. There was a lot going on. So I went to, um, I went to um, a, rehab, uh, a rehab spot. I was on the, the vancomycin twice a day for an hour, like two hours a day uh, for 12 weeks. Um, like I said, I was on lorazepam, oxycot. I still remember this stuff. Lorazepam, oxycot, oxycodone, metro dose, the whole nine, and um, it would take it would take the pain away, but it was still it was the worst pain. If I sneeze, I cried before I sneezed, and then I cried harder after I sneezed. It hurt. It hurt. Um, walk, taking a step, walking up the steps. I had to sleep downstairs a lot because I couldn't make it up the steps. I couldn't sleep in a bed. I had to, I had an afro at the time, so I had to peel myself up like a fruit roller, <laughs> and then have someone push me off the bed. And you know them bastards. I mean, I'm sorry. The doctors told me that I was getting out of bed wrong all this time. That I'm supposed to get out of the bed, roll over to the side, and push myself up. Isn't this a sit up? <laughs> Aren't we told the exercise you got to do sit? I'm thinking I'm not that old. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I can't be getting out of the bed like that. I'm not. I, that's not. I'm not. I'm doing it anyway. So they were they were telling me all these things, and and uh, I was getting frustrated. But over time, I did the I did what they asked me to do. That was February 2007, and I got off all the pills and everything in December. 2007. So 2008, I was fine and I started moving again. The one video in the school with me on the floor that was um, that was the end of 2007. I felt comfortable enough to do that. I still didn't put my head on the floor because it was still kind of sore. Um, but that's how that's how that went. So it took about a good eight months, uh, eight ten months for me to feel comfortable again. Um, yeah, so you guys can come on up. <coughs> I'm putting the shield on that yeah. Yeah. Is this it? Yep, slide it across. I know oh, no, that's the wrong one. I'm just looking at them blue the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't it either. Uh, I missed the whole. <laughs> okay, sorry, man. Uh, that's the thing. Okay, so that's Joshua Colbreth. You don't get no clap. <laughs> Actually, Josh is older than him. <laughs> so he's not the youngest. So that's Josh. Christopher LaPlante. <laughs> Ricardo Romo, they call him Stuntman. <laughs> and Jerry Valme. <laughs> People used to think he was my son. I'm like, get out of here. I'm like, I look better than he does. Um, uh, but
But no, you can ask them. You can ask them uh, questions. What, whatever your question was, I can't remember. What your background? <laughs> what your background is? Uh, make it short and simple. Uh, I started off in high school. Saw a friend doing it. I was very, uh, I was a very introverted person. And then the dance helped me really communicate to people a lot easier. Uh, dealing with Rav, he taught me how to really uh, tap into my creative processes and just really believe in what I can do in life in general, no matter what it is. Because he's the only one really doing this on this level with breaking. And a lot of times you'll bump into people like, oh, I want to do this for a couple of years. And one of the biggest things he said to me was, you're putting 25 years or so time into this just like uh, anybody else would in any other career. And then why are you not able to make something happen off of it, right? And it, it does take a, a leap of faith. And then the biggest thing is like, the path is there, you just have to be able to see it and make it happen. So yeah, and Josh and I are collaborating to get to that level too. Yeah. Um, I was, I'd been part of hip hop since before I even knew what hip hop was, uh, I was 11 years old. Uh, I started dancing when I was 16, uh, and to this day it's probably, you know, not probably, it is uh, the most amazing and longest standing relationship and, and I owe a lot to it, so I, I put my heart and, and so into the dance floor, uh, and about, to this day, I go to sleep and wake up thinking about dance, it's taken over my life almost to a scary level. <laughs> Uh, I grew up doing uh, competition dance, uh, but since I was five, got do started doing competitions and stuff when I was like 13, doing jazz and tap and partnering and all that stuff. And around that same time, I started getting into actually competing. I started getting in teaching. I started teaching myself like how to pop and wave. My popping isn't very good now. My waving is still okay. Uh, and then like I was still like, but at the same time, still doing the competition track and stuff. And then I got to college. Uh, found out about concert dance and modern dance and all this stuff and I knew uh, a couple steps of breaking but I didn't know how to connect the dots like I didn't really speak the language and I, was, I took this class and this guy uh, this old breaker in, in my hometown he saw that kind of he saw that I knew some things so he showed me this one little thing and the light bulb went off I was like oh. <laughs> So I stopped. I still I'm still doing the contemporary modern stuff, but then at that time I was like, all right, well, let me get my, let me get, let me get, let me sink my teeth into this breaking stuff and, and try to figure it out. So, so. What's popping and waving? Waving is like is when your body is like really fluid, like. That was sucky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let Jerry show you in a minute, Josh. Real quick. Real quick. <laughs> Uh, I started at the age of five, uh, self-taught. Um, my mom showed me some stuff from how she would dance in the skating rings and on the block parties and stuff like that. Uh, won the Apollo a few times. Uh, what else? Um, basically got, out of, got into high school and had my counselors tell me I need to get into college because I'm not going to be able to do this for the rest of my life. And Decided at that point in time I was just going to prove everybody wrong. Um, <laughs> counselors, parents, anybody who didn't believe in me. And I've been now doing this solely for the last... I've been dancing for 21. I've been dancing on stage as my sole job for the last 10 years. Oh. <laughs> and it's funny, Josh is in uh, Rennie Harris Pure Movement. And um, I remember going to practice and watching Josh as a kid practice and then next thing I know he's like literally on stage with me with Rennie Harris Pure Movement it's like yo this is crazy like I watched the kids grow up and and perform you know on stage so this is an amazing an amazing thing um, hip-hop uh, there's several different forms just popping locking uh, strutting different different funk styles that they call them they come out of the west coast and they preceded what we know of as hip hop today. Um, it was just that it was, they're, they're all social dances and people forget that it was social dance. Um, which means that you go out, you dance with your friends, you dance at clubs, you dance at parties and things like that, you meet people. It's a whole, what do you call that? It's a whole family thing, not a family thing. It's, yeah, it's a whole function, right? And then on the East Coast, there was, there was um, breaking. 
and breaking came about in the mid 70s but it was it, it looked very different than it did today it was you just drop down you do a couple sweeps swipes do some shuffles and you get up and if you look at that stuff that was done then you can see people like Sammy Davis Jr. doing it uh, e even way before that it didn't really become it ca called hip hop until the 80s sometimes where this guy named Africa Bambada decided to call this 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 group this these dances that were grouped together at a party the graffiti the DJ the rapping the dance, different variations of the dance at one shot. It was under one umbrella. As a whole, it was called hip hop. But again, <coughs> some of those dances that came from the West Coast had already been in existence. So as time went on, you have, um, you have people that just pick up something and put it in the cauldron of what they call hip hop and it becomes hip hop. But you can totally dissect all that stuff and you know find what it was before it was called hip hop. That's why I always say it's just movement and whatever you apply to it, whatever music you, whatever your background is, it becomes what you want it to become. But popping is, uh, there's waving, there's popping, there's, uh, there's strutting, there's ticking, there's animation. All these things are variations of these funk styles. So Jerry, um, can you do the, some waving and just popping? So I see Waving, right. <laughs> and this is hitting. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> uh, you were first. You were first. Oh, keep popping, hitting, hitting. Dude, it's oh, yeah, also yeah. hitting. Yeah, it's, also, it's just the pop of the yeah. Okay, okay. Just, yeah. Okay. It's it literally just flexing yeah. your. Right? If you have enough, you can do that. Just stop. <laughs> I can't do it well. That's why I don't do it. But, um, I just wanted to say that the, 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 when they were helping you up, I didn't realize that that was you that needed help. Getting up. And so it just was very sweet part of the dance. Yeah. And I was wondering, you've got all of these different ages going on. Have you thought of sort of taking off on that element of people needing help or dancers helping each other or something like that in the performance? I have not thought about that particularly, but it, in the beginning of the work, Chris actually falls and then Josh helps him, right? And then so I back him up by doing that little fall thing and it's, it's, it shows the vulnerability, right? And the mistakes that we make as performers. Um, also, um, I had two trains going, they just crashed. Uh, the, the helping people. Oh, there's, there's poetry in the piece too, right? So we dance to poetry. And that stuff is the, from, the perspective, from my perspective of seeing something that I can't do anymore, right? So these guys are flying and, and you, hear the, you hear the poetry say stuff like, I want to be that, I want to do stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? I want to be just like you. Maybe I don't want to be that kind of thing. Like, so it's a, it's a tug of war in my head that you hear me, that hear us dance to, that's just about that, right? Kind of like, um, kind of shifting, shifting a little bit to be vulnerable enough to allow someone to help you or like there are things there. You go through the door or you stand behind the door and complain, right? Don't be tough all the time. Open it up, go through the space and venture out on your own, right? So yes, it's in there, but not as deep as it can be. Um, yes. Do you tell stories through the dance, or is it a performance because of the movement? Is it a story? It's both, and it's about it's about that more about um, um, me just experiencing things through life, ups and downs. Uh, what else is in the th What else is in the, uh, about silence? Like dancing to silence. Like all these things that go on in my life that have gone on in my life are put into this work. So there's a there's a narrative in the work that's tied together through the vocal <laughs> bless you, the vocal play. And um, the, the other thing is, it seems a very predominantly a male dance, is it? Is no. it? No. No. Do you see my face? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's, there's, um, it's only male dominated right there. 
right? Uh, but, but there was a girl. There was a girl. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, was a girl. Um, but generally speaking, what's impression is that it's. Yeah, only gods. because only be yeah only because they're. Um, there are girls there, and they're good. Some of the girls like were better than every one of us up here now, um, and it, it just depends on what they do with it and how well they're seen. Um, but it's it is male dominated. But there there are girls there. Just more guys have that cocky <laughs> attitude and energy, and some females are like that. But still, it's just you know. Yeah. Yes, it's male dominated. But there are some women in there who would take you out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What gave uh, Robin Jules such broad appeal? I think it was the first time that someone had put uh, hip hop with a, a Shakespearean text or Shakespearean mm. idea, especially mm. at that time. It was all hip hop was still new in the theater. Like Rennie Harris is is considered one of the first out of two, that one of the first um, hip hop dancers or companies to put hip hop on a concert stage, concert form, right? And so people were very interested in what that looks like outside of a street form. What does it look like with Shakespearean body? What does hip hop look like with Shakespearean body, Shakespearean text, the approach, the stage, the direction, set design? Had never been done before. And I think that is what the appeal was. So it, it toured for a long, it toured for 10 years. I was out of it before it stopped, but it toured for at least 10 years. What was the audience? Was it was mostly their appeal? younger people? Or? Oh no, it became, a, a, believe it or not, they were all older um, audience, uh, subscriber based audiences. Hip hop people and younger people weren't, weren't privy to the theater. They didn't know what it was to go into the theater. You don't go into the theater. You go into a movie theater or a stadium, but you don't go to a theater to see performances. And that stuff's not for me. That's what they're thinking. There's nothing that's interesting to them unless they go to a performing arts high school or college. As they get older, then they go, okay, maybe I'll go and see. But hip-hop on stage like that was not well known. And the only time we had people come to the theater to see us was if we told them we were in there neighborhood, their city, their state, whatever, and they would go, oh wow, I'd like to see the show, so we'd get them comps. And then they would open up to that and be like, yo, I've never seen anything like that before. But most of the time there were subscriber-based audiences who frequent the theater all the time and were interested in seeing something fresh. Yes. Is there a video of the Roman jewels that we could see, that we no. could have access to? No. Okay. I don't think there's... Um, I don't, there might be some, but it's all on videotape, and yeah. I, don't, I don't have access to that anymore. I don't know where my tapes went. Um, but if you look on, if you Google or look on YouTube for Roman Jewels, somebody put a couple some, clips some up. Yeah. You'll, find, you'll, find, you'll find some clips. Yes, ma'am. So much of what you're doing seems to be a community-based thing. I mean, on the stage, you're clearly interrelating and aware of each other. Indeed. Is that part of what the creation of the dance is amongst yeah. yourselves? It's still there. It's still, it's still that. Like, although I come from, a, uh, uh, I'm still in this place of wanting to create the choreography, I still have to ask these guys for their input and like, if they do something, let's, let's play with that. What is that? Let's do that there. Let's put it here. So yes, we're all involved. Their solos are their solos. As choreographer, as a choreographer, I can't just make this, especially this dance, I just can't make this dance all choreography. It takes away from where it came from with the improv in the street. That's always going to be there. Even if it's 10% of the show, I have to have that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that the dance itself was created in the community. It was created in, in, in the barbecues and in the homes and different parks and playgrounds. It was that thing. Like You see kids play on the in the park today, that's part of the community and they'll do the shoulder thing or mm -hmm. they'll talk about somebody like if, I'm gonna be funny right here, but I'm serious. Your breath stink, your breath stink, you need some toothpaste. Like they will they will rank on kids are cruel. And they will talk about your pants, they'll talk about your shoes, they'll talk about your house, right? And they have dance with it. You ever see kids eat? They want to dance with you and they eat and food. It's called the food dance. They have them eating dance. All that stuff is so social, all that stuff is part of the community. It it goes into creating whatever it's creating in the hood, then it goes to Maybe the television or a video that somebody sees who's like some famous 
choreography for a singer, so it goes on video, then the world sees it, and now it travels. Yeah. But that one famous thing that everybody is doing was started in somebody's backyard, on the corner somewhere. Right? So yes, it's still there. It's still there. Um, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Is there a story behind your becoming the stunt man? It all seems like amazing stunts to me. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's my alias, my dad's name, uh, besides Ricky Rockenny. And when I was a little kid, I was the one that would do a lot of stunts. I wasn't dancing yet. I was, uh, I was into riding and skating. So I'd be, you dare me to do something? I'd be the dude. <laughs> so I, would, you know, I had my share of jumping off two-story buildings. I would always try to have people hit me with their car because I thought I could dodge it. Uh, I wanted to be a stuntman. The adrenaline of getting into something that can put my life in danger is and was more so like mesmerizing to me. So that's where that came. You know what? To that, to that, to this day too, um, I have to say this is one of the few guys that I know. If I thought hard, I would think about that. I mean, I would come up with someone, but off the top of my head. I remember this guy was doing what he was doing when he said he wasn't a dancer yet. When you watch a lot of people do the dance, and you see him do what he do, that don't count, get out the circle, you whack, the, the, right? They make fun of it, because it, do, it doesn't register. And he kept doing what he was doing to this day. And now it makes sense. There's people who have watched him over the years that now have taken his style and incorporated it into their thing and even thank him like yo man I watched you and on this video I saw you somewhere and I've been influenced by your moves so again one of the things that I tell the younger people is stick to your guns like it's not it's, it's not gonna happen overnight and just because you're not getting instant gratification doesn't mean you need to change your path like stay stay there you have to you have to cultivate it you have to really get into it and find who you are in this movement and eventually you'll be set in your body you'll find your own way right so a lot of people kind of get off the path to be like someone else and then they regret, regret it later on because they were on to something so he was one of those guys I remember seeing and hearing about and to this day He's still doing what he's doing, and it makes sense. And I've always told him, like, yo, you need to be on stage, man. Like, there's, there's stuff that you're doing that really makes sense as a, as a dancer on stage in a way to help the dance move forward. Um, I saw a hand over here. Yeah, I was just wondering, where do you perform, like, throughout the year? Like, uh, East Coast, throughout the country? And how do you get your, uh, your gigs, and uh, how does all that stuff work? I, I've been... Well, we just came, last, this, this piece started touring last year. We were at ICA in Boston. Then we went to St. Joseph's, Connecticut. Connecticut, St. Joseph's. And, uh, um, we were Boston. at UMD in, uh, in Maryland. Yep. Then we were just in Cleveland. Yep. And now we're here. Uh, we do Philly, Annenberg Center in November. And then we go to Albany. I want to say it's the egg. I might be wrong. We go to Albany in, in November, and then we start the year again. I don't know where we're going next year, but it's uh, it's most of the gigs are always booked a year or so ahead of time. I used to do it on my own, but I have an agent now, and, and they do all of that, the, the booking and stuff. And your now, audience is mostly uh, hip-hop? Like this. Like, like this. Like this, yeah. I mean, hip-hop people don't come to the shows. <laughs> Still, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> we knew some cats in Boston, in, in Connecticut, right? Yeah. One person came. <laughs> and And... This little. Yeah. No one else came. And we know him. Huh. We know him. No one comes, man. Well, how do you explain that? Why is that? I, two things. I still think they're not ready huh? for this kind of thing yet. Huh? And they still have some hate on them. They still have, <laughs> they have that ego thing like, I, I'm, I'm, that's not my crew. It's not, I'm not going to see it. You know, who knows, huh? man. But um, I think that's one of the reasons why this form is still in the infancy stage. It is still. Right, that little tug of war or that 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 two toughness that they have. Are there any other groups like you that are doing this? Breaking, not really, but hip hop in general, yes. There are there are a lot of companies who are like they they involve all the forms of hip hop, which are popping, locking, house breaking, um, some tap, even a little bit of modern. They incorporate everything into the form. But I just I always felt like this this form was. There's so much to be seen, there's so much to be done and explored, but still young, man. Um, but it's difficult, it's hard, it hurts. And you can't, you can't go from being the greatest in a circle and flying and, and then go and perform like three times a week 
it hurts, right? <laughs> and then you can't, you can't, everybody doesn't move the same way. In Europe, they do. I don't know what that's about. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to find, um, find a group of people who want to, you know, create this kind of thing over a period of time. Again, it's an hour work. If you watch the TV shows now, like, uh, World of Dance, uh, mm -hmm. So You Think You Can, not So You Think America's You Can Dance, dance. Yeah. America's Best Dance Crew, piece is 30 seconds long. Mm -hmm. That's cool, it's cute, but it isn't. <laughs> and you can't do what, 50, 30 second pieces, right? That's not, they don't, they don't know what that means. They just do a little piece, a little piece. I had a friend, incredible, incredible guy. Had a two-minute piece, and I put him. I did a circus last year it's in the courtyard of City Hall. I said, "Dude, I need you to make this seven minutes. I'll help you." Okay, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got it? Yeah, I'm ready. I got about five. Okay, let me see it. It was two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, no, you gotta expand it. Right? You gotta expand it. Let me see you do it. Okay, yeah, yeah. You practice. I got it. <laughs> he did it again. It was two minutes. <laughs> I'm like, yo, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? Long story short, he could not get out of the pattern that he had been in for so long. It felt long. <laughs> two minutes is a long time. It felt long, but it was not. And I was like, listen, take it, take it apart. Do some here. Go over here. Do some right here. Repeat it. Go over here. Do it again. Now, do the whole thing right here. We can get about four minutes out of that. <laughs> so he goes just like this. He goes, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving, he's done. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> I don't know what to do with you. Right? <laughs> but you can't, it's really hard to get out of that. You know, you, you have to think. And I've been fortunate enough to see how people create choreography and not just routines. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I just applied what has already been in the, in the space. You know, not create anything new, but just just take the tools and, and, and uh, those things that help them create and move forward. I can do that with this. and It's not changing the context of the movement or nothing at all. Mm -hmm. It's That's just taking those, those aesthetics to inform the movement to move forward. You mind if I add something to that? Real yeah. Quick? Uh, my first time working with him, and I feel like this is his initiation to find out if anybody's ready to even try to like work with him at all. He'll give you five minutes, and he'll go, let me see what you got. <laughs> you start off, you're like, yeah, I feel good. Oh, man. 30 seconds in, you're like, oh, man. how much more time do I have left? Like, you, know, you, know, you, you finish, you get up, you're like, oh, man. It's like, you still got more time to go. Oh, yeah, but it's, 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 yeah, it's a wonderful like, like, feeling. And then like going through it, you see someone else go in, into it. You think about your mindset when you first did it to where your mindset is after all the time working with him, physically you, you start to transform into like somebody where, where you, you, you really understand where you have to really breathe, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to really apply yourself a little bit more or less and still give that same impact no matter where the energy level is at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask you about the importance of live dance as opposed to or side by side with film and TV and whatever. Repetitive, you can see it again. But the necessity, I'm aware of at least, for the artist to constantly be live and growing. Yeah, this is extremely in, in, important. Um, the more you perform, the better you know your body, the better you know the space, the, the, the theater setting, the audience, what they like, and all of that stuff. Um, I mean, even with performance, once you record it, you can watch it over and over, but it's not the same thing. The audience doesn't get the same thing. As, as us, uh, as the dancers who are watching it, we, we want to watch ourselves. When we watch a, a, a piece of work to critique, you're watching yourself. I, I have to watch everybody, but most of the time, they're watching themselves. So they can watch that over and over again. It's ego. Right? just want to see you do that move. Yo, you see my solo? Yeah, you messed it up. <laughs> uh, but it, it has its purpose. But I think uh, the, the, the best feeling is, is alive. Right? I have a show that I did called The Unofficial Guide to Audience Watching Performance. It was an, auto, it was an autobiographical piece. Josh played my 20 year old, uh, my 13 year old self. Jerry played my 20s, and I was the adult. 
There's a moment where I come into the I come into the audience, the, the, the stage, and the audience is the classroom. From the, the, the announcements that's made, turn off your phones, make sure you have, you know, silence them. I make that as a school announcement from the principal, <laughs> right? So people are chuckling, they're laughing, and at that moment I have you, right? I know, I know who you are, I know you're into the show. So when I come into the class, there's papers in the seats, and there's cameras in the seats. I get Jerry, after he's picking up papers from the floor, to go and get the assignments that the classroom has to hand in. So now you're part of the performance. As soon as you hear that intercom, you're part of the performance. So you ha as soon as the papers are handed in, you're now part of the performance. So it's not you watching anymore. Now you, you want to know what's next. Is he going to call on me? <laughs> like what's going to, you know what I mean? So you're live. So I wanted to play with the audience in that way with that show. And it totally worked. And they even come down on stage. He goes and get them unknowingly. He says, anyone with cameras, follow me. And they look around like, oh my God, there's a camera here. <laughs> and they get up and they like reluctantly follow him on stage. And then they, they, they're on the floor with us taking pictures the whole nine. So, yes, live, you can't enjoy that on a video. It doesn't work. You have to do that live. But, but that was one of my, that is my favorite performance because I, I get the people, as soon as you come in, you're mine. I can do whatever I want and you're right there. No one ever watches, like, what time is this over with? Like, when are we out of here? What is, right? And when it's done, they're like, it's about an hour long. And they're like, oh, that's it? Wow, that was great. It goes by just like that. But I like stuff like that. So one of these days, I'll do it again. I just don't know when. How much time do we have? Uh, one more question? Cool. We have one right here. I want to know what you do to keep yourself in shape in yeah. good condition. Keep doing it. <laughs> you don't do a class or Pilates or yoga or any of the other training methods that dancers use. Sometimes. You, like, I feel like that now. I have to. Um, I do go to the gym. Um, I don't do any cardio because the dance for me is the is the cardio, mm -hmm. and I'm very I'm I'm a thin guy. So if I do too much cardio on a treadmill or something, I'll lose weight. Like I lose weight fast. Um, but massage, um, gym, stretching. These two stretch all the time. Um, I think we he probably does too. I see I see them more than than these guys, but. He doesn't stretch like me. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, yo, touch your toes. <laughs> no, but we have, we do have to do that. I realize the older you get, you you have to, you really have to do that. I'm, I'm so messed up. I had to pay someone to come to my house to do yoga because I, I leave the house going to do yoga, but I just don't make it. <laughs> I eat a detour, I go get some juice, or I'll see somebody and be like, yo, where you going? Like, to the park? Like, are you <laughs> But no, I had to pay somebody to come to my house to, to teach me yoga, because I would not go. If I left the house on my way, I detour. <laughs> <laughs> one more, we'll do one more. Yes. Hi, um, I break also, and for me, a big part of it is kind of the freestyle element as well as the battle element. And I'm wondering how you address that through your dance if it's um, on a stage. And do you battle each other or do you battle other people? Or is that even a part of it for you? Well, I'll let them answer too. Uh, when we go back and forth on stage, there is this kind of battle-y thing. Like someone does something and you'd be like, oh man, I got it. You know, you go and you try to outdo that and the next person go in and outdo that. The battle mentality is still there for people who do battle. Um, but it's very different to have that mentality on stage in front of an audience because it doesn't read right. You know what I mean? It comes off as something else. Sometimes it might come off as arrogance or too much machismo or something. It's hard to define or hard to describe on stage. If you put two dudes on, on stage and battle, it's still this. It's not that. Like It's here. We're battling each other, and it's lost. And you have to figure out how to make this look like the battle. You're part of the circle, you know? So we'll do this. We'll make a half circle, and then you guys, actually, the audience completes that. So you just see this in and out kind of thing. Um, 
but it, you can't you can't really get the same idea about battling on stage uh, on the street than you can on the no. stage. Yeah. But some people will bring that thing into the space. Anybody else? I think, I'm about to say like I think for me personally like one I was never a I never got too deep into battling, but I will say like. It's like a constant, like kind of competition with myself whenever I go out, especially when I do like my improvs and stuff. So it's either like a, if I'm doing like stuff on the ground, if I'm doing like breaking stuff, it's like you know how intricate and how clean can I make the footwork and everything happen. And then if it's like some of the contemporary stuff, it's like how much can I really authentically listen to the impulses that are happening in my body and not take the funk. I'm just trying to get claps. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the audience to clap for me just as much as they clap for one of my uh, teammates. In the beginning of the show, I'm like, yeah, oh man. Later on, I'm like, I'm not keeping up with that energy. Because it's like fresh every time. I'm like, look, I'll find where I fit. And if it works, it works. But yeah, and sometimes it's like a subliminal type of message to each other, like, yeah, talk that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, look, I look at the dance as having multiple uh, languages within the dance, so I can present a movement and I want to know my audience. So if I'm in a battle, I'll make the exact same movement and make sure it's battle, it's reading as a battle move. If I'm doing it as a showcase, it reads as a showcase battle. If I'm doing it on stage, it reads as a stage battle. If I'm in a cypher, it's going to read as a cypher. So even when I'm creating a certain movement that I've been doing for a year or ten years, I make sure that I try to be able to adapt that to any space, whether it's on stage, whether you guys are above me in a balcony, whether you guys are below me, whether I need to point it directly at you, or if I'm doing it in a cypher setting. A cypher is just a circle, and that's like where this dance was born. So for me, if you can't do it in a cypher, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it, and that's just a personal thing. But I think my movement, and when I'm on that stage, I know there's a certain, you know, there's no one behind me, and sometimes there's no one on these sides. So I need to make sure that I'm projecting, and that the energy you guys are getting is this way versus that way. Uh, I've actually, I've, I'm pretty sure I've battled on stage before during the performance on multiple occasions. Uh, uh, being a dancer in Ray Harris, I grew up with a lot of kids, or been on stage with a lot of kids around the same age as me, and who also came up uh, breaking alongside of me. So there was a lot of tension and a lot of beef. You know, being on the same stage with somebody that you feel so you're better than, you, you kind of feel like you have to have a lot of one upsmanship. So uh, any point in time where it was free to just freestyle and you can go after anybody you wanted to, it'd be like, okay. Um, this person's gonna go, he's gonna give you a look, now the battle's on. The game has started. From It's go time. And you have to get through the show, you have to, you know, have the integrity of the show, but you understand that there is a natural competition going on between you and somebody else, and nobody's trying to back down. The show will be great, <laughs> but nobody's backing down. You will see stuff that is not choreographed, stuff that does not belong in the show at all. I'm not going to lie to you. I have went from doing house popping or locking to a, a flip pass from one side of the stage to another side of the stage, getting back into the choreography, landing from a back flip, and everybody's just like, um, that wasn't a part of the choreography. <laughs> I'm going to clap for that. <laughs> like, the audience doesn't know. Nobody knows except for the people who have been in rehearsal. So, so it's like it's cool, it's fun, it's fun. You know, as long as you don't hurt yourself, it's fun. But at the same time, it's uh, it gets quite dangerous because you 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 put yourself in a mentality where I want to outdo you, I will do whatever it takes to outdo you, and that's not what you want to bring to the stage. The stage is is meant to show artistry of whoever the choreographer is. I mean, the choreographer is at the time. So you're there to uphold their vision not your personal goal or your personal gain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, you got, I hope you guys come to the show and you can see, you know, what we do, how we do it, it's right, and it's live. So you get to see, <laughs> you get to feel the energy. Um, and then you can ask, we have a Q&A afterwards, so you can ask more questions based on what you just saw, or even like to compare today, what we said today um, with, with tomorrow. There's also a class tomorrow at 9 o'clock if anybody wants to come. 
um, and you can take part of the class and see, you know, how this whole ground core thing is what what I call that stuff on the floor. It's part of a it's part of the form. It's called text. <coughs> but um, after the injury, I started to call it ground core because it <laughs> bless, bless you. you. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes place on the ground, and it's really about strengthening the core so you can strengthen and heal and, and move at the same time. So I can't as long as I'm doing this smart, I won't hurt myself. Again, you're always going to have like, you know, sprains here and twists here, but um, ultimately you won't be as your your body will be able to recover faster when you're when you're you know really tight. So if you come to class tomorrow, you can see some of those things, even if it's just to watch. You can ask questions there too, but you get an idea of, of what really makes this thing Where is the fire? Yeah. It's at the yard. It's at the yard. In Shomar. Yeah. <laughs> at 9, nine, 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 nine to 10.30. Yeah. You can take a bus and take another bus. It's a trip. You want the bus. But it's worth it. It's yeah, and uh, otherwise, otherwise, I hope you guys come and see this show. But thank you for having us. Um, great time.